Hi, my name is Alexandra, and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt, where we read better, not more. Today we are wrapping up our introduction to the Iliad with a look at the poetry. I have already discussed the mythic and historical context um, for the Iliad, and you can see some links showing up up above to watch those videos as well. But for today, let's get into the poetry. I'm so excited. This is like my favorite one of the videos we've done so far. So. Let's talk about the Greek and the meter. So the Greek of the Iliad is Homeric Greek. It's a little bit circular. In a typical ancient Greek class, what you learn is Greek of the fifth century from the Attic Peninsula, so that's the area around Athens. This Greek is quite a bit earlier and includes some slightly different grammatical uh, usages, including a fun way to pluralize nouns called dual. So Homeric Greek had singular and plural, just like we do, and then they also had dual, which was used for pairs of things, so like pairs of oxen, for example. I love that, and I think we should bring it into English, because it is wonderful. I like complexity, can you tell? The Iliad is a poem of 15,693 lines of dactylic hexameter, so you may recall uh, iambic pentameter from Shakespeare, yes, another Shakespeare reference. While a dactyl is a meter of poetry that has one stressed syllable followed by two unstressed syllables. And hexameter basically means that it will have six of those units in each line. So the Iliad, like the Odyssey, is constructed into 24 books. Any epic that tried to work in the same tradition also worked with a similar structure. So the Aeneid has 12 books, as does Paradise Lost. Each of the sections of Dante's Divine Comedy, so the Inferno, Purgatorio and Paradiso, each of those had 33 cantos. Um, so again, we get this book structure throughout all of them. However, this division was added later to the composition of the Iliad, much, much later, perhaps as late as the third century BC, but we can reasonably conclude that Homer had no real intention of it being divided up that way. It's more convenience. It's at the natural breaks in the story. The story is constructed also in a cyclical pattern. So book one and book 24 are mirrors of each other, each with a scene of a father coming to beg and ransom for something very precious to them. Likewise, two and 23, three and 22, and so on. Some scholars have even charted this structure to be the case within individual books and theorized that it's like a technique that made me memorizing such a long poem easier. Other tools like having stock metric units to slot in where needed also made this sort of like quasi extemporaneous performance a lot easier. So some examples of these formulae are found within the characters' names. Those are easy ones to point out. Brilliant Odysseus, you're gonna see that phrase over and over again. And it's just because in the Greek, that particular unit is maybe forms a really nice metrical or pair of feet um, that they can just slot into you know, align where needed. And while Odysseus is known for his intellect, there are many uses of uses of this formulae purely for metrical reasons and not for content reasons. So what do I mean by that? So for example, Zeus can be called the father of the gods and men, or he could be called cloud gatherer, right? The description would be chosen not because we wanted to emphasize his absolute authority over gods and men in the one title, or because we wanted to emphasize his connection to nature, storms, lightning, his sort of like primeval power, but rather because one had the correct number of syllables and pattern of syllables to fit the line and the other did not. So this makes like interpreting the poem, it, if we do it on a micro level, the way that we do like other poetry where we take a look at every single word and where it's placed and whether it's repeated and that sort of thing and say like, what does this mean? What is the author intending by using these words here? It's not for content reasons and it's not for symbolic reasons. It's actually more likely to be just for those metrical reasons. 
the performance. So having a professional rhapsody or bard or whatever perform was very much an elite upper class experience. So a performer was often engaged for a private party. The recitation would have taken place over two or three days. And it actually would have been probably for a celebration, a birthday, a festival, that sort of thing. But it also would have been a very like relaxed affair. So think more like jazz band playing in the background than classical performance where we're sitting down and all paying attention and watching. You can imagine the guests sort of reclining on couches, coming in and out, having quiet background conversation, um, getting food to eat, even interacting and reacting to the story as it's being told and showing their joy or horror or laughing at the jokes and that sort of thing. The performer also had the freedom to expand or shorten various sections and would have responded to audience interaction to sort of like gauge interest. And the catalog of the ships, is, which is book two, is pointed out as a famous example of the opportunity for the bard to interact with the audience basically based on his geographical location and where he's performing. So he can sort of like quickly move past the people groups or ethnicities or island nations that like are not relevant to the audience, but digress into extra canonical adventures and get into the background of various heroes for the areas that are relevant to the audience and make it a lot more interactive that way. The bard would probably accompany himself on the lyre as we see Achilles do in this book as well. So Achilles in particular is singing, but we have many other times, especially Nestor, who's a little bit long-winded, sort of get into this sort of oral performance in the storytelling mode within the Iliad. So that kind of works on a metacritical level. It adds credence and value to the position of oration and especially storytelling, not necessarily speech giving, although that certainly has a high position in the Iliad as well. But it adds credence to that sort of central position of oration. And finally, we need to talk about the epic simile. So this is a, con a construct that deserves a great deal of attention, probably more than I'm going to give it today, but we'll probably take a look at some as we get into the book itself. An epic simile differs from a regular simile, really only in length and complexity. So it's epic! Um, Homer consistently uses similes to transport the reader out of the war scene because of his lengthy descriptions. He gives history, context, extended description to the compared reality. And these epic similes also, interestingly enough, draw out contrast. So they're set up, obviously, this is like this, is the basic structure of an epic simile, of any simile, but he's using them to actually emphasize the contrast, emphasize the things that are different. And he does this overall on a macro scale because a lot of the things that he's using in his similes are domestic scenes, agrarian scenes, nature. And so they set up this contrast to the bloody conflict that's going on at the same time. But they also give us a peek into the domestic life that the Greeks are fighting for. It makes their invasion of Troy a little bit more empathetic. Whereas with Hector, we actually get to see his domestic life because the setting of this story is in Troy. So we get scenes of Hector with his family, with his father. We see what their family life and their culture is like. We don't get that for the Greeks because they're the invading force. They're the ones who have left home and come here. But these epic similes give us sort of like a little peephole, a teleportation into what that life might have been like. And, and we get to see sort of like past this warrior culture that's being presented throughout the whole you know narrative <laughs> because it's you know about a war but it's also on an individual scale so we talked about it on an overall scale that homer is using these but it's also on an individual scale that he draws out contrast as well so there's one lengthy simile that i want to use an example it occurs in book 12 and the things that are being compared is like in reality the Greeks are, have come up to the wall of the Trojan city and the Trojans are throwing down like missiles and stones and things like that on the Greeks. They're pelleting them from above and the Greeks are sort of like launching spears and stuff like that back up at them. So that interaction is compared to a heavy blanket of snow falling. So again, we get the contrast of like a natural and peaceful scene with the chaos and violence of war. But I also feel that in this one in particular, there's a great deal of sound contrast. The snow is so quiet and 
quieting that it, if you've been you know in a snowy place by yourself you can just hear the hush your own footsteps the, it, the snow actually deadens sound so it's very very silent and then obviously that sound is contrasted with, with what you would imagine you know like the sound of stones being dropped on human bodies and many men like fighting and clashing in war i actually think that this sound contrast is a technique that we still use in modern mo war f movies it's something that really heightens the tension so you can imagine that there's a, a war scene in any movie that you've seen right so there's this raging chaos we see the fighting ka -ka 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 -ka, they're going at each other it's loud in the movie theater and suddenly it's ing. you know they do that ring sound and it's this ringing silence maybe we focus in on the hero or we focus in on what the hero sees with these sweeping views of the chaos around him but it's still that silence and then suddenly it's pierced by you like my sound effects on this one you know gunshots are ringing through the air and the chaos kind of swarms back in on the scene basically it adds variety to the tone of the scenes but also builds tension so um anyway i'm gonna read this to you now because it's it's really beautiful language i'm gonna look over here because this is where i have it written down and i have to read it so I can't look at the camera, sorry. And they, as storms of snow descend on the ground, incessant on a winter day, when Zeus of the councils, showing before men what shafts he possesses, brings on the snowstorm and stills the winds asleep in the solid drift, enshrouding the peaks that tower among the mountains and the shoulders out jutting and the lowlands with their grasses and the prospering work of men's hands and the drift falls along the gray sea the harbors and beaches and the surf that breaks against is stilled and all things elsewhere it shrouds from above with the burden of zeus's heavy rain upon it so numerous and incessant were the stones volleyed from both sides, some thrown on Trojans, others flung against Achaeans by Trojans, so the length of the wall thundered beneath them. It's so good, you guys. It's just so good. <laughs> ah, but that's all I have for you today. Next week, we are actually digging into the actual text itself. Um, you probably want to read maybe the first book for this next discussion, though I'll probably go beyond it if you read the whole book. Um, <laughs> that would be awesome. Uh, we'll be taking a look at the characters of Achilles and Agamemnon, analyzing them, and then also understanding their conflict. Until next time, I'm Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile. Mm -hmm.